Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Our next panel is on secularism as a human rights. Um, the chair is the author of the uh, book Jalad, Death Squads and the State Terror in South Asia. Tasneem Khalil is a Swedish and Bangladeshi uh, journalist and editor of Interna Independent World Report of a Journal of Human Rights and Global Politics, who will be chairing this session. Tasneem, over to you. Uh, yeah, we are missing one panel member. Um, she is my Facebook friend. If that matters. Huzan uh, Mahmoud. Huzan Mahmoud. Huzan. Okay. If you make a start, I'll go and send the search party for her. Okay, excellent. Um, yes. So whenever I'm taking poses like this, I have a very, very bad handwriting, and even I cannot understand that. So anyway, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank someone very, very special. And uh, people with Muslim backgrounds know that Hazrat Aisha, uh, one of the wives of Prophet Muhammad, is often referred to as the mother of the believers. And we have today amongst us the mother of the Murtas. And it's an honor to, to come here um, at her invitation. Maryam Namazi, thank you so much for doing this. That's the title of Dia's next film. Uh, so, <clears throat> before we go into the discussion, the panel uh, discussion on this. I would like to just uh, note that there can be so many definitions of secularism. You can have very, very postmodern uh, definition of secularism, which is to say no definition of secularism. Uh, but I actually picked up something from a stall here which uh, just says it as it is. Secularism is a principle that involves two basic propositions. The first is the strict separation of the state from religious institutions. And the second is that people of different religions and beliefs are equal before the law. That's it. That, that's what we are referring to uh, here today. Now, in the morning, Bonna Ahmed actually touched upon this. She mentioned the history of colonialism. And she also mentioned that while Europe was going through this process of secularization in colonized world, in the, in the third world, we had uh, religion-based politics introduced by the colonialists. So whenever we are having this discussion, we need to remember this, that religion-based polit politics, religion-based state uh, in a post-Westphalian world is actually a gift of colonialism. And if we are to fight colonialism, then we must also fight religion-based states and religion-based politics. Now, I personally, and I do, I mean, my authority on this is that I do have a degree on human rights, that's it. Uh, I personally don't think that we should be identifying secularism as a right per se, uh, and we can have a debate about that. Uh, I see secularism more as a framework of delivery of human rights, like democracy. And very quickly, I'd just like to mention that, I mean, we can have a very, very secular system where human rights abuses uh, go on uh, very uh, wantonly. Uh, case in point is China, where you have 
uh, a separation between between the charge or the state or no charge. Uh, but then again, you have persecution of Uyghur Muslims, for example. And first, I'd like to start with the international system, international system of human rights, and how the international system of human rights, what we refer to as the uh, system that comes from the international bill of human rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and um, the ICCPR and other conventions. How do you make sure that how, 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 how do you say, how, how, what, is the, what is the role of secularism in protecting the rights mentioned? And my question is to Karima. How do you make sure that secularism is used as a mechanism, as a framework to deliver the rights? So thank you very much uh, for the question. And I also would like to thank Mariam Namazi and the organizers for giving us this important space. So I think it's important to think about what exactly is guaranteed by international human rights norms in the area of what is called freedom of religion or belief nowadays, or FORB, because everything has to have an acronym. So if you look at Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, we find very clearly uh, that it is guaranteed the right to be a religious believer, uh, the right not to be a religious believer, and indeed the right to change belief. Uh, and it also guarantees the right to express uh, belief, but this part of the right is subject to certain necessary limitations uh, when those are necessary, including to protect the rights of others. The ICCPR, as we call it, the covenant, also guarantees that there is to be no coercion uh, in religion, and I think it's critical to consider that as well. So, you know, what does this tell us overall about the view in international law of what should be the ideal re relationship between uh, religion and the state to guarantee human rights? There's a very big debate uh, about that. Uh, I can say you can look, for example, at the book uh, written by a scholar named Jerome Temperman, arguing that there is an emerging uh, right to what he calls religiously neutral uh, government. Uh, I looked at what some of the UN mechanisms uh, have said about this, and it was interesting to note, uh, I looked at this with a student, that a lot of what the UN human rights uh, mechanisms have said about uh, secularism has been negative in the sense of how secularism, if not carried out in the proper way, could itself violate human rights. But very little attention, unfortunately, paid to the positive uh, aspects of secularism vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, human rights. And I've been stunned at some of the statements that have come out. For example, uh, Ken Roth, a few years ago, some of you may remember this, uh, the director of Human Rights Watch, an organization which has done some very important work, uh, including uh, defending people who are victims of abuses carried out in the name of religion. But in 2011, uh, in response to some criticisms of the Human Rights Watch World Report uh, of that year uh, by women of Muslim heritage, uh, uh, things that were said in that report about Islamism in particular, Ken Roth chose to write that there is no right to separation of religion and state, which I think is a remarkable uh, assertion, especially if you, if you look at the context of what was happening in 2011. So I actually think uh, going along the lines of Jerome Temperman and perhaps going beyond that, we really have to claim the importance of secularism, as Tasneem said, as a tool, as a framework for guaranteeing a range of human rights. These include the right to freedom or relig of religion or belief, including the right not to believe and to change belief, but also other rights, including the freedom of expression, the right to be free from violence against women and discrimination against women. And the area that I work on is the UN Special Rapporteur in the 
field of cultural rights, uh, cultural rights, because there has, is so much of an overlap uh, between culture and cultural expression uh, and uh, freedom of religion. So in my report to the Human Rights Council in March, which is about fundamentalism, extremism, and cultural rights, uh, I very specifically recommended uh, to states that they need to provide for and protect the separation of religion and state and guarantee religious freedom, including the right to believe, not to believe, and to change, change one's belief. And in the follow-up report that I'm doing uh, for the General Assembly in October, uh, there is a whole paragraph about uh, secularism in the text, uh, explaining my understanding of the term, uh, explaining very clearly using a quote from uh, Gita Sagal, who is here, that this is not about the absence of religion, uh, it's not an anti-religion stance, but it is about a state structure that defends uh, freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief, where there is no state religion, where law is not derived from God, and where religious actors cannot impose their will on public policy. Uh, and I know that this is going to get a great deal of pushback, uh, so I look forward to finding ways to work with all of you to push this report through the UN system and get support for it, because I really think that the struggle for secularism is uh, sort of a key human rights goal in the current moment. So. One of the questions we often get is, what can we do? Like, what can you do to support? I mean, this is a concrete way of supporting. I mean, create pressure uh, through lobby groups uh, on your national government so that they can, uh, they can sort of enable the excellent work Hirma is doing in, in her capacity as a reporter. I'd like to move to uh, the European Parliament. Uh, we have a uh, MEP amongst us, and uh, we, we talked about United Nations, and I am very interested to know about uh, your work inside uh, the parliament and at the, at the EU level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Marianne Namathy, along with the Dutch professor Paul Kliter, you remember, Marianne, uh, was our first guest in Euromind. Mm, for those of you who are not all that familiar with Euromind, uh, we organize lectures, just one or? <laughs> lectures and publications with a commitment to freedom of thought, religion, and speech, support for science-based policies, and the integration of all Europeans within a common political space. I am, as you said, a member of the parliament. Uh, I am in ALDE, that is the liberal group. I'm a free thinker and a liberal. Individuals who hold secular belief and who place their faith in science and tolerance remain our natural allies. In their name, I have frequently addressed parliamentary questions regarding human rights issues to the European Commission and to the High Representative Federica Mogherini. Okay. <laughs> the most recent include the case of the German satirist Jan Bergerman, the disappearance of liberal activists in Pakistan, the case of Ibrahim Sharif in Bahrain, extremist homophobic preachers in Europe, and the problem of blasphemy laws. I have also voiced concern with regard to the situation of non-believers in post coup Turkey and in Pakistan. I have directly expressed my concern at the attempt made by the Pakistan authorities to force Twitter and Facebook to disclose information about the users. This information was to be used in order to identify individuals suspected for blasphemy. These are universal values, as has said uh, before Pragma Podel, but uh, are specific European values, espe especially now that we are constructing, building Europe. Uh, and they should be the values we uphold. Freedom does not simply mean multiculturalism. Above all, when the defense of multiculturalism supposes that we become indifferent to the characteristically human search for truth and happiness. I read in the hope that the European project will come to embody the universal principles that form the backboard of an open society. 
I must say now that I'm very sad for Brexit because of Brexit, and I hope that it could be reversed. This morning, uh, our friend Anthony Grayling had said me that it could be possible. Uh, and he's a very wise man, and I believe him. I, 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 I hope that uh, could be reversed in the future because it's very, very sad that we are separated. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, if we have uh, individuals in the audience who would like to later also comment on uh, on this, I'm I'm personally very interested to know about what uh, Brexit means for a secular Europe and secular uh, UK. Um, I'll now move to Michael. I understand uh, you have been engaged in lobbying uh, with. United Nations, with Council of Europe, with the uh, OSSC, the organization. So how do you see this? How do you, uh, uh, what are your comments on lobbying uh, for secularism at these institutions? Well, first of all, we have a, a policy in Atheist Ireland that when we are promoting atheism and reason, we use the language of philosophy and science but when we are promoting secularism, we use the language of human rights. And when doing that, we, we respect the right to freedom of religion as well as the right to freedom from religion. But we use very fundamental principles, the right to freedom of religion or belief, the right to freedom from discrimination, the right to equality before the law. We try to educate the public, first of all, and also our politicians that these are very fundamental rights. And also we try to highlight with our governments that once they sign up to the various United Nations or uh, Council of Europe treaties, um, that they are subjecting themselves to an oversight on their human rights obligations that they have to adhere to. And so the, the main bodies that we engage with are the United Nations, where there's a big distinction to be made in the United Nations between the, the United Nations Human Rights Council which is essentially a political body where the states are policing each other, which can be quite compromised and which ends up with things like Saudi Arabia chairing uh, subcommittees of the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council. And on the other hand, the human rights committees, which are the bodies that oversee the uh, obligations of the states under each of the treaties. And th those committees are made up of independent human rights experts, and they're not engaged in these political tradings that you get at, at the council level, they are just examining each country once every few years under each of the treaties to say, here's article such and such of the treaty, here's your behaviour under this, can you explain to us how that behaviour is compatible with your obligations under the treaty? And civil society bodies such as Atheist Ireland are able to both make submissions to those bodies and also go to the meetings as they're happening, brief the Human Rights Committee before they question the state delegation, and then as the session is happening, if the state, as is quite frequent, uh, gives misleading answers, we can, in real time, as the sessions are going on, let the committee members know that that's misleading. Obviously, we have to give them supporting evidence. They're not going to question them on the, on the basis of somebody saying something. But if we give them, here's an example, this is what the law actually says, this is how it's incompatible with this article of the treaty, they, they will incorporate that into their questioning so we can have a direct involvement there. Uh, the, the, uh, another body that's very important to us is the OSCE, which is the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Now, they have, as part of their uh, overall scheme of things, that they have a strand that deals with human rights. They have in uh, Warsaw every year one of the biggest human rights sessions in, in, in Europe that goes on for two weeks. We go over for the sessions on freedom of religion and belief and, and the sessions on freedom of expression. And again, at the, in, in those places, we, we can highlight before delegations from other states information about the discrepancies between what the states are saying they're doing and what they're actually doing on the ground. Another thing that the OSCE did that is very useful is they have put together a document um, called the Toledo Guiding Principles 
on teaching about religions and beliefs in a, a, a pluralist society. And that's a document that we use as, as a go-to in our lobbying in, in Ireland with the Department of Education because it provides an objective set of criteria for how a curriculum should be delivered objectively, critically, and pluralistically when teaching about religion. And it takes it out of the realms of us just arguing this is what we want and being able to say this is what an independent body of human rights experts, including members of religions, have come up with as a fair way of dealing with, with, uh, with, with the complexities of these situations. Now, the one thing I'll, I'll close to, to, to bear in mind about this, it's not a magic bullet. They can't enforce what, the, what they're, they're recommending, but they do provide a lot of both moral pressure and, and political weapons that we can then use in our respective countries when lobbying our politicians. Thank you. So this, these reporting mechanisms, which uh, Michael talked about, are, are, can be also be very crucial once, I mean, I know, for example, if you want to force the government of Bangladesh for, to comment on a specific case, I mean, the United Nations, uh, different reporters can, 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 can uh, be really useful in, in doing that. Um, we were talking about this before, uh, and you also mentioned that you um, also work with uh, Ahmadi Muslims, because this is one thing I want to focus a little bit on, because secularism is not only an issue for uh, the secular or the atheists or the humanists. It is also a very crucial uh, burning question for the religious also. Uh, case in point, the Ahmadis, uh, especially in Pakistan, which is a religious state and which is a Muslim state where a specific group of people uh, are barred from saying the shahada or, or saying their prayers or, or engaging in Islamic rituals. Can you very briefly tell us a little bit about your work with the Ahmadis and other religious groups? Yes, we, we work, as, as I said, I'll preface this by saying that when we are promoting atheism and reason, we are very strong about that and we, we do not compromise our belief that atheism uh, is, is a more reliable worldview than religious or faith-based worldviews. But concurrent with that, when working on secularism, we are happy to work with religious groups who themselves are also secular, that they hold their beliefs as strongly as we hold, hold our beliefs, but that they also want separation of church and state. Because separation of church and state is the only way in real terms that you can protect everybody's rights equally. Because if we would be as opposed to the state promoting atheism as we are to the state promoting religion. So we work with the Ahmadi Muslims and also with the evangelical Christians in, our, in Ireland as three groups with very different worldviews but who are all discriminated against in Ireland by the, the support that the Irish state gives to, to uh, Catholicism mainly and Christianity generally. But also because we all have members of our respective belief groups in Pakistan who uh, are afraid in many cases to speak out for themselves, we, we made a submission and sent a delegation just a couple of weeks ago to the United Nations Human Rights Committee when they were questioning Pakistan. And we were there as three groups from Ireland highlighting the human rights abuses in Pakistan on behalf of people who had passed information to us. And that was a very powerful message, both in terms of its content and also in terms of the symbolism at the United Nations Human Rights Committee of having three groups of very different religious views, particularly from an island where, in, in Ireland, where, where, which is seen as riven with, with sectarian strife anyway. I think we've moved on from it, but that's certainly the image that, 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 that we have. It's very important both, both, both symbolically and also practically in terms of the input that we were able to make to the committee. So it strongly urged people to, to, uh, to, while continuing to promote our own beliefs uh, philosophically, to be prepared to work with religious groups who also support secularism in the context of separation of church and state. So, I mean, I'll move from secularism as a... Uh, protection for religious minorities to secularism as a protection mechanism uh, or, or ensuring mechanism for women's rights and, and, and children's rights. And any you have worked on that for many years now, as I understand. Uh, can, you, can you just tell us a little bit more about that? 
I think that secularism is not just a right, it's a necessity if women are to be free and children's rights and gay rights and so on. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which it's entering almost our 40th year, and I'm a co-founder when I was a college student, um, began because of the battle for abortion rights in the United States. And my mother was an early crusader for legalizing uh, abortion and contraception in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, everywhere we went, it was the Catholic nuns and priests and busting school children filling the Capitol Rotunda and speaking to the legislators about uh, the Bible says abortion is murder. And she went from being um, a general activist feminist to being an ardent secularist because we realized that we would never be free until our laws were free from religious influence and our social policy. And I, this is just one example, but it is true uh, throughout the whole civil rights um, agenda. And unfortunately, we are facing, um, you know, we saw great successes in the United States, and we are at a very perilous time once again, even though we have a secular constitution. Uh, the religious right is, of course, um, in control of almost everything right now. Um, more than 30 states are completely Republican-dominated, both houses and governor gubernatorial. Uh, the Congress and, of course, the presidency, I liked Dawkins' air quotes. And we have um, uh, the Supreme Court in jeopardy. And so um, it has never been clearer to us how important it is that we not only have a secular constitution as the United States does, we were first among nations, it was the only original thing really in our US Constitution, it's godless, and its only references to religion are exclusionary, such as that there should be no religious test for public office. And uh, the First Amendment with its establishment clause that Congress may not um, respect an establishment of religion. Well, these are wonderful concepts, but they are uh, not respected. And in fact, it can be a kiss of death for a public official to be known as an atheist in the United States, and the polls always consistently show um, that atheists are unelectable, that about 50% of the population would not even consider uh, voting for president or vice president if they were known to be an atheist. And we're at the bottom of the social totem pole today with Muslims when it comes to surveys about who would you want someone to marry, uh, who's filling our prisons. They think atheists are all criminals and prostitutes. It's ridiculous. But so it's a PR problem at this point as much as a legal problem, and I think that's probably true globally. Uh, so we have a great secular constitution, but can we keep it? And uh, women's uh, rights are um, hinging on all of this, and we are facing the defunding of Planned Parenthood, which provides most of the contraception in the United States, as well as um, basic health care for women. And fighting for contraception, I mean, this is ridiculous, not just abortion rights. So um, we are um, all fired up about the importance of secular government and constitution, but we have to take this to the court of public opinion and win there. Um. And I have been listening to you, and uh, what, what, what sort of jumps up is this uh, secularism uh, serving the interests of different divergent groups, like the, the seculars, the atheists, the humanists, the uh, religious minorities, uh, women's rights groups, children's rights groups, uh, democracy activists. Uh, and I know, Chris, I mean, you have been involved in building sort of coalitions between diverse groups uh, serving this ultimate goal of protecting the principle of secularism. I'd like to hear more about that from you. 
Okay, thank you, Tasneem. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I have in the last years, um, ever since I um, was the president of my uh, the Atheist Society at uh, my university, been involved in various campaigns, uh, bringing together various great activists that are also present here, obviously like Mariam, uh, like Yasmin Rahman, um, like... Um, um, Hosan Mahmoud, like Pragna Patel, uh, on campaigns such as um, freedom of expression within universities, um, Universities UK, the gender segregation case that we won, the Law Society case that we won again, and um, I'm you know helping generally with various campaigns concerning uh, gender segregation now. So how do we bring together these um, secular movement, this inclusive secular movement? Um, let me start by saying something controversial, um, maybe controversial. So, and um, just to be clear, before um, before I say that, I am um, the guy um, who is known, I guess, who started his you know his activism as the guy who allegedly terribly offended religious people. Um, allegedly, by wearing a Jesus and Mo T-shirt at his university freshers' fair, was then um, physically forced to cover up. Um, that T-shirt later on went on the BBC, The Big Questions, um, with the same T-shirt, again uncovered the T-shirt, and um, yeah, there was a bit of a debate going on there, um, out there, um, to put it that way. Um, so I'm not the guy who's um, quite afraid of offending anybody's sensibilities. However, I think um, that it is can be um, extremely um, difficult and um, dangerous if we exclude, effectively exclude many religious people um, from our movement, from our secular movement, which should be an inclusive movement, um, by um, being much more antagonistic, to put it in some way, um, than maybe we should be. So, um, beliefs are for scrutiny, we Religious beliefs are for scrutiny, all beliefs are for scrutiny, for ridicule, for lampooning, all of this. When we go to cross that line to thinking or saying that people are stupid because um, they believe in certain tenets of their faith, um, I, don't, I think that's, first of all, wrong, it's not secular, and it's um, probably very unhelpful in a practical terms for building the, those inclusive co coalitions. Um, we have to decide at some point whether we want to have more of an atheist secular movement or an actual secular movement. Um, I know, we know, that many religious people um, are inherently supporting our fight. Uh, most Catholics in this country support the right to abortion. Um, most Muslims um, are not fundamentalists. Most Hindu Hindus are not Hindu Dwar. But yet, if we look around here, I would say that's my guess that most people here are not religious. There should be far more religious people here supporting our fight. And maybe part of the reason why they're not here is um, that some of them don't like to be put on trial for what their religious beliefs are. And I understand that because I wouldn't be put, uh, like to be put on trial and asked why I believe in such stupid things as atheism either. Um, and I think that is something that we have to think about. So the thing is, The National Secular Society, of which I'm a council member, um, has made the decision some years ago. We were an atheist, explicitly atheist organization, and we have moved to become a fully secular organization, and we are still on a path to making um, our organization even more inclusive to religious people. And I think that is a good thing. So, well, in a nutshell, it really is this. If you want to work with people, don't put them on trial for their beliefs. Do criticize them, do scrutinize them and their beliefs, but in the end of the day, secularism is a political movement. It's not based on identity, or shouldn't be based on identity, or shouldn't be based on someone's faith or beliefs about the supernatural or more questions of morality or whatever it is. This is a political movement. Let's work together in an inclusive way. Uh, Can you. I add something very briefly to that? I, I, I do agree with you, but I think the inclusiveness should be in the form of alliances. I don't think that it should be at the cost of ceasing to promote atheism and reason as a better worldview. 
I don't think, um, I, I, I'll just have to go ahead and disagree with you there, Mike, if you don't mind. Um, I don't think a secular movement should be based on the promotion of any faith or non-faith. And that includes, by the way, uh, this idea of, for example, um, you know, we have to promote a good Islam that's sort of better than a bad Islam or a um, you know, better Christianity or something like that. That is something that religious people have to uh, make up for themselves. And we should ally with them, uh, but that is not something we should um, inherently promote in and of ourselves. Yeah, as much just very brief, you, you, what, good, uh, good the, the point I was making is that you said you, you had moved from being an atheist movement to being a secular movement. I think you can remain an atheist movement, just as the Ahmadis remain a religion and the evangelicals remain a religion, and still work together in a secular alliance. But we're not expecting the Ahmadis or the, the evangelicals in Ireland to give up promoting their religion. And equally, I don't think we should give up promoting our worldview either. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, what, what, I, uh, I mean, what I understood from Chris is that he's making a point from, from, the, uh, from, a, from a very strategic point of view to, to begin with. Is, is that correct? Like, it is a strategic point, but it's also a principal point. Yeah, but I mean, strategic political uh, strategizing the political movement, if if I can say so. Okay, yeah. uh, I'll I'll have to uh, let's let's have a discussion on that. Uh, I'd like to hear from the audience as well later. Uh, I'll now turn to Huzan, and uh, thank you for patiently waiting. It's fine. Uh, uh, you, you have been working as a cultural worker, and you are the founder of the Culture Project, and you are using cultural work uh, in, in sort of uh, serving this goal of, of establishing secularism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you so much, Maryam Namazi and Council of Ex-Muslims for organizing such timely and important conference and for inviting me. And secondly, I would really like and I feel obliged to always pay tribute to the most courageous Kurdish women and men who are in the forefront of fighting against ISIS, the most dangerous, monstrous, sexist, uh, masculinist, racist forces of our, our time of 21st century. Uh, I was, I was actually uh, showing earlier on to my friend Benjamin, a uh, Kurdish woman who are in the neighborhoods taking up arms to actually uh, fight against ISIS. And this is how we are defending secularism. This is how we defend human rights, women's rights, and, and the right for a society to exist. Uh, secondly, I would like to say that I'm an atheist, and I don't care if that offends anybody here or outside of this place, because uh, we are being offended time and time and all, all over you know, the world, everywhere throughout history. Women have been offended, their rights have been violated, and nobody asked them, are you offended? It's us who have been fighting for our own rights by our own, on our own and so many times alone as well. So, you know, and, and I feel like, <laughs> thank you. I feel like there is so much apologetic um, you know, language going on everywhere that I've been, all over the places, even at universities, that is supposed to be the place for uh, scientific research, education, intellectualism, and so on and so forth. I found so much bigotry and backwardness that was shocking, especially in somewhere like UK universities, generally speaking, whereby they just shut you up and they silence you and they call you Islamophobe, full stop, without listening to your story and where you come from and what you have been going through, by the way. For people like us to be there publicly to denounce their religion, it cost our lives, okay? But we do it because it's not a Western or Eastern thing, as other speakers before me uh, emphasized, the importance of this movement, the importance of actually being who you want to be. Uh, and then, uh, so, so that's why for me, uh, defending women's rights, secularism, and so on and so forth, and feminism in general, is not a single issue. It's all related. Uh, it's very important when we speak about cultural productions, be it poetry, literature, 
literature, art, music, and songs, and, and you name it, it's important for it to exist. It only exists in secular spaces. I mean, you know, everywhere Islamists pop up, straight away they target music, they target, you know, art, they tar target scientific research. I mean, so many times uh, they, they issue fatwas against scientific research. They issued fatwas uh, for books to be burned because some poetry or some parts of, of the uh, literature uh, criticized something about God or religions and so on. That's why for us, uh, it's very important to raise awareness about feminism and gender issues as well as secularism. We can only function within a secular discourse and art and music and everything and women's rights can progress within a secular society, not otherwise. Wise. I mean, I just want to comment on some things that was earlier on discussed on the panels before. Uh, why, when it comes to the rights and freedoms of Middle Eastern women, we have to go back to religion and, and negotiate our rights within Islam? That's bullshit. I'm sorry. Because, you know, <laughs> just the example of that girl in short skirt in Saudi Arabia it shocked and it brought down the entire Saudi Arabian kingdom, let alone going and, and uh, uh, talking about women's rights within Islamic laws of Saudi Arabia. This is, this is impossible. You cannot actually uh, relegate women to go on about and going to mosque with men. So what? Is that all the freedoms you want me to have going to mosque? with men or having a female imam as if we had enough, uh, as if we didn't have enough of male imams, of brainwashing people. Now you want to brainwash women and young girls in a Muslim, this time with a female imam. This kind of tokenism of some Middle Eastern women or Asian women uh, arguing for an Islamic feminism or so-called women's rights within Islam, it's only a blow to the women's rights movements that is secular, that is progressive, and that is leftist and egalitarian. And that's why I cannot really uh, support uh, or agree uh, with such, uh, to, to argue for women's rights within such frameworks or within any religions, be it Christianity, Judaism, whatever, Islamism, you name it. And thirdly, I would like to say that so many times in the West, they think they have to uh, support Islamism, because they cannot separate between Muslims and Islamism, honestly. I, even the most intellectual people I came across, you know, these debates. Whereas it's actually what we are doing is defending ordinary Muslims. It's not about that religion have no space, but it's actually us, millions of Muslims who have no space who have no place to, to express themselves, to, to express their creativity, to basically coexist. I mean, Kurdistan is pr probably the only place in the Middle East that so many religions can live together. You have church, you have everything, various religions, but still, that is in danger. I mean, we are still in the fight with ISIS. And as you know, I don't have to tell you what ISIS did to the Yazidi Kurdish women, and that still so many thousands of them are captured by them, selling them as sex slaves in the slave markets, you know, raping them over and over again and treating them as, as slaves. This is the kind of ISIS ideology. If you don't accept it as Islam, I'm sorry, it's one of its versions. People keep on telling us, well, Islam has many versions. Well, this is probably one of them. I mean, uh, you know, taking the enemy's wives and daughters, it has been done all over, over the past 1,400 years. It's nothing new of Islamist movements and Islamist ideology and governments in the region. Stoning, killing of homosexual people and lots of other issues that is going on. That's why we have to, wherever we are, we have to create secular spaces, be it through art, through poetry, through scientific research, through education, and through women's organizing as well. For me, there's only one form of organizing, and that has to be secular and feminist, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to especially thank you for mentioning the quotes. I mean, we have had lots of discussion today about left and regressive left and progressive left and liberal left. And unfortunately, I had the feeling that by left, we mean Western left. I mean, yes. that, that is an error we should try to avoid yeah. because uh, the 
most leftist secular democratic participatory movement right now is the, the, the struggle, the fight is being fought by the Kurds in ISIS territory. And that is something we need to recognize whenever we talk about left and right and mm. all that. Uh, before I open uh, for questions, I would like to just ask my panelists if you have, uh, if you just want to very quickly comment on the discussion so far. So I'll start with Chris, uh, if you have any comments. Um, my only comment would be that I want to make sure that what I said earlier is being understood in the right way. Being an atheist is a form of resistance and the face of religious privilege and states that are often theocratic or non-secular, being an atheist is something important that we obviously should um, support as a secular movement. Um, I still do agree, disagree with Mike that we need to promote atheism for that reason. But secularism obviously does not um, equate or for not promoting faith or not promoting a um, atheism. Um, the thing, the, I think the issue we need to think about, how do we make allies and how we do, do we get a movement together that challenges fundamentalism um, in the broadest sense, a big society, big tent movement, and you know, therefore we need to make some choices. That's what I think. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, thank you. Very quickly, Teresa, if you have any comments. Yes, just to say that I have a strong commitment with secularism. I think that uh, secularism is one of the most important pillars for the construction of uh, Europe, the, the, the United Europe. Uh, we have a, an important migration of people that have a political and religious agenda that we uh, that worry us very much. But also, as the the policy speaker before has said that uh, about his country, the problems that he has, uh, there are countries in Europe that are well. Uh, the, the religion is awakening now, uh, as in, in Poland and, and Hungary. I think that is a, is a, a a big danger for these constructions. Well, uh, just to say that one of my main uh, concerns in the parliament is the defense of this idea of the uh, secularist uh, Europe. Thank you. Uh, any, your quick comments. Uh, I was going to say I thought that Charles Bradlaugh might be a little surprised at the change with the National Secular group, but I think it's fine. I think there are different ways to get at the same problem, and it's fine to have basically a state church lobbying group. But at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we don't separate the two things because um, when we say there shouldn't be religion and government, then the largely religious population says, why not? The Bible is a good book. It should be invoked in our government. I mean, you're, you're running into this circular argument with them. And I think that when we see what has happened to um, outed atheist bloggers and authors uh, in Bangladesh, we saw the movie, we know what happened to Bona and her husband, because they were atheists, that it's ever more critical that those of us who are safe to come out as non-believers, as free thinkers and atheists must do so. Human progress and survival depends on free thought, the use of reason in forming our opinions. Thank you. Karima. I Go. think we need to be incredibly conceptually clear that when we're talking about secularism, we're talking about secularism, and when we're talking about atheism, we're talking about atheism, and those two, two things may overlap in some places, but they are not contiguous. We have been making this point again and again when people in certain regions are accused of being atheist, when they advocate uh, secularism, so there's a common misconception uh, about this. I think the struggles of atheists are, are very important, but they are 
are separate and we really have to maintain the clarity. I like what you said about the different strategies you used when you're lobbying for one thing versus uh, another. Another thing I think we urgently have to do is to reclaim the human rights space, which is not only, as the brilliant Pragna Patel said earlier, being undermined by fundamentalists, but almost even worse, it's being used by them uh, to promote their and even justify their abuses uh, of human rights. And we see tremendous prejudice against the concept of secularism itself in much of the international human rights movement. I think that that is something we absolutely have to come together to challenge. And I hope that in the remaining 24 hours plus that we have here, we will start talking about strategies. Because at the end of the day, what's most important is not how we fight amongst ourselves here, but how we fight together when we get back out there tomorrow, which is a very lonely place. Thank you. And sorry. I just want to give one, sorry, very yeah. quick thing that, pe that my suggestion of one small thing people can do. I want to talk about following up from my report to the Human Rights Council and lobbying in support of the next one. And if anyone is interested in meeting me and my colleague Joanne Bouchard from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights tomorrow during the break from 11.55 to 12.30 out there to talk about it, uh, please see us there. Thank you. Excellent. And also, please sign up for the mailing list. Uh, I think y your office puts out something like that, uh, and, and you'll uh, receive regular updates. Uh, Michael, very quickly. Yeah, when I talk about promoting atheism and reason and why it's important, what I mean is that belief in gods is based on faith, and faith-based worldviews are less reliable for both understanding reality and understanding morality than our non-faith-based worldviews. And even if we got a secular world where, where in the context of separation of church and state, where, where the, the state was not giving any privilege to either religion or atheism, it would still be important from our perspective to persuade people, not by force, but to persuade people that reason and atheism are a better and more reliable worldview. So I think it is, it is important to do both, to maintain the integrity of our worldview while also being prepared to work with integrity in alliances with religious people who also agree with separation of church and state. Thank you. Uh, who's on? Well, to me, I think the most natural thing to human beings should be atheism because when we are born, we actually have no nationality, no religion, no language, no ideology. It's all constructed and created. And I think we should not, for the sake of secularism, we should not brush uh, atheism under the carpet because it's a bit controversial. No, I, I disagree with that completely. And I think uh, we really have to keep that momentum going and that the right to atheism is, is a fundamental human right and, and it is important for so many people who do not uh, uh, organize their lives around what somebody said 2,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, whatever. So this is a very basic and fundamental human rights, in my opinion. Uh, also, I just wanted to emphasize on one important issue that, uh, yeah, so many families in the Middle East probably, or at least from my own experience, they are ordinary Muslims, but that doesn't mean they are fundamentalists. That doesn't mean they advocate Sharia law. I grew up in a Muslim family, and still some of my sisters, they wear veils. Some of my other brothers, they practice Islam, and I'm an atheist, and we all love each other, and there's no problem. You don't have to tear families apart and to take up arms against each other and kill each other because you are this or you are that. I mean, as I said, ideology is religions and politics and so on and so forth, uh, you can change them, you can adopt them, you can just basically leave them and you don't really have to sacrifice one for the sake of another. And what has been the dominant discourse is that as if Islam is in danger of being uh, wiped out from the, the planet. That's not true. It's actually Islam is making, uh, or Islamists are, um, are making demands everywhere in the world and it's going ahead, ahead for them. They have mosques and, and religious schools and Islamic schools for children to brainwash and so on and so forth, which we have to argue for those to be closed down. And you, you are allowed to practice whatever religion you have, but you do not have to brainwash your child with it. You know, I'm a feminist, but I don't necessarily brainwash my 
child into feminism. I want her to grow up and to explore and, and to know. And, and in fact, she studied all religions. I didn't even impose my atheism on her. I wanted her to find out by herself. I mean, every, every day she came, uh, up, she came home with a joke about religions. And you know, it's not my fault. When you are actually given a space to think, to be who you are, to be independent thinker, then you can decide. But when you actually decide for somebody from a very early age, then it's a very difficult, uh, it's very difficult for them to come out of it. I mean, so many youngsters in UK, they just blindly wear burqas and veils and they're at universities. Just, just, you know? I mean, you, you do like, uh, you, you are referring to religious education also, mm -hmm. to, if I understood yes. correctly. Thank you very much. Thanks. I am now going to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. I'll take one, three at a time, one from the right, from middle and left. Uh, and thank you for your Bruce and uh, Iram for doing this. Uh, who is the right winger? Okay, the lady at the back there. Yes, can you just, uh, in the white shirt, yes. Sorry, just a quick question for Karima. Karima, you de defend cultural rights in UN fora. How are these cultural rights different from group rights which conflict with individual rights? And how can we ensure that individual rights will be protected if we're defending cultural rights? Okay, thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to take a question from Mariam. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, your contributions. I wanted to just comment on, on this issue because I am really frustrated about it, to be honest, and I'm exploding out of frustration. And the thing is that I think we can work together on many different issues, even though we don't agree, right? Uh, for example, we can work, all of us, together on secularism, even though some of us might be believers and some of us might hate religion, for example. It's possible. And it's, it, but we shouldn't be asked to leave everything else of ourselves out the door just because it might offend someone. And it's interesting because we never demand that of the religious. We never say, I won't work with you as a Muslim woman on secularism because your beliefs offend me. And let me tell you, Islam offends me. It offends me greatly. My whole life has been bulldozed by this religion. But every time we go into the public space with our secular sisters who are religious, some of them, not all of them, because we work with lots of great women, they keep telling us, well, you know, atheism and secularism is separate. Yes, but I'm still an atheist. Can I not speak? And, it's, and we are accused of not being inclusive. Yes, Karima, we are accused of not being inclusive. If I say that I think Islam has something to do with Islamism, some of our sisters won't even speak to me anymore. They don't want me included in any of the meetings. Well, learn to live with it. The point of this conference is that we have just as much right to say what we think, to criticize religion, to reject religion. And it's, can I tell you something else? It's hurtful, it hurts, because I don't expect anything from the Islamists, I don't expect anything from the far right and the fascists, but I expect things from those who call themselves secularists and then try to silence me when I want to criticize religion. I ask you, I accuse you of betraying me and betraying this movement when there are so many people suffering under Islam's rule and suffering for being ex-Muslims. Where are we when you speak about your secularism? Where are we? We are not anywhere. And when we come and do everything we can to support this movement, we're told, oh, you're offending me. Well, get used to it. Get used to it. We exist too. We have a right to say what we want. And we can be together in this fight for secularism. But don't make us deny who we are. Uh, I'm going to take a question from the lady here in the... Sorry. Yes. You, please. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Nadia Alfani, um, Franco-Tunisian filmmaker. And um, I, I want to say, you know, two years ago, I was here for the first conference, and uh, I was asking to translate, you know, the French term, laïcité, in every language of the people, you know, representing their uh, country here. Because I think secularism is not the good word, you know. Laïcité is a principle. 
It's something uh, could be written in the, um, how do you say, um, um, human rights, you know, uh, and in the law in the countries. And we are, I'm glad, you know, to hear you about Europe, you know. I think we have to ask all our country to put this principle in the first article in the law, in the fundamental law, in the constitution, because this is the best way to protect all the religion, if you want to believe, you know, but we are atheists and we need laicity because we cannot live in freedom if we don't have laicity. For me, the laicity is the first step for democracy in our country. In Tunisia, after, re after revolution, the first demand from the youth was, you know, like it's written in your photography here, Liberté, Democracy, Laïcité. It was the first demand from the youth. I made a movie about this and I was attacked. I was the first one, artist, intellectual, as you want, you know, attacked in Tunisia after revolution because I was fighting for laïcité. And I, can, I cannot tell about what happened to me after because you can imagine, you know, about Islamists, what they did to me, but the f f worst thing was, was the reaction of the left in Tunisia, of the Democrats. They ask, you know, the freedom to uh, uh, Ranouchi, who was in, in, in Great Britain for 20 years because he was in, in charge uh, on justice in Tunisia because he, he was a terrorist. And the Democrats in Tunisia asked for freedom to him to go back to Tunisia. And after he took the power, you know, and now he Islamizing Tunisia and Tunisia is lost for democracy. I can tell you now, I'm really, really sad to tell you that Tunisia is lost for democracy. There is no more revolution in Tunisia. Thank you. Karima, there was a question directly to you, so I'd like to uh, like you to start by responding to that. I think uh, it was about collective rights and individual rights. Uh, so I think the question is actually more generally about the concept of cultural rights, which are perhaps one of the lesser known parts of the human rights regime. They are covered both by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which in Article 15 guarantees the right to take part in cultural life uh, without discrimination. And I have been very clear, as has my predecessor, uh, the Pakistani feminist Farida Shaheed, uh, that cultural rights are not the same thing as cultural relativism and they are to be understood within the context of the universal human rights framework. They are not a departure from uh, that framework. Uh, and Farida Shaheed wrote a very interesting report, for example, about women's cultural rights and the need to uh, not only see the ways in which culture has been used as an excuse for violations of women's human rights, uh, but also to fight for women's equal right to participate in culture, uh, including the decision of which cultural practices uh, to leave behind or to jettison for human rights uh, reasons. So that is very much uh, the established framework now in the cultural rights uh, area. Um, I'm not really sure whether to respond to Mariam's comment or not because I'm not exactly sure if it was directed at me, but uh, um, you know, uh, I think we have to decide whether we're willing to have a discussion in which everyone can feel comfortable. And I can tell you, maybe lots of people don't feel comfortable in this discussion. And it's not about, I, I think everyone is free to be whoever he or she is, absolutely. It's about presuming that we all in the room have the same worldview. And making sure that when we say we and our, that is an inclusive we and our. And I am happy for that inclusivity to be based on the diversity of who everyone is. And I certainly didn't mean anything I said to silence atheists simply to remind us that this is 
a secular conference, and not everyone comes to the table with the same worldview. So I do sincerely hope uh, that we can find a way to have these difficult discussions uh, and to work together uh, uh, beyond them. But I don't think it's terribly helpful to accuse people of betraying the movement when those people <laughs> work 24 hours a day uh, towards the same goals. We have to be able to transcend, I think, that way of addressing people when we disagree with them. Uh, Chris, would you like to, yes, uh, yes, you, you would like to comment, yes. Um, I'm a member of the culture committee, but also the, I'm a vice president of the delegation of Maghreb. I visit uh, the, the countries of the north of Africa, Morocco, uh, Libya, Tunisia. Uh, we are very worried about Tunisia also because it was an example for everybody, uh, the history of, uh, of the, the freedoms that uh, nobody knew in the area. But now I know that this, uh, this country is in a very difficult moment. Huh? Um, I'm very sorry to say this, but I hope that <laughs> everything will... I'll, I'll, I'll just move on uh, so that I can take more comments and questions uh, from the audience. Anyone on the left? Gita, yes, please. Well, sometimes it's... Um, I'm, I'm Gita Segal, Center for Secular Space. I, uh, Karima very kindly quoted... Um, uh, from uh, my definition of secularism. It's um, an honor to be in a UN report, particularly one written by Karima Benoun, um, and particularly when I've really gone outside the framework of the official human rights movement uh, by the stand I took against Amnesty International and their relationship to um, a, a, a jihadi. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's really wonderful to be recognized there, but I thought I would talk a little bit, just very briefly, about my journey on these questions. Um, because I grew up in a free-thinking family. You know, I didn't have one second of discrimination on the grounds of my religious belief. Um, and that family were a family that fought colonialism and that really built, and uh, that are the forgotten history of the human rights framework. They fought against colonial domination in the UN Charter. Um, they fought for the right of colonial subjects who were not recognized as rights. They fought for women's rights. They fought for the inclusive language, all human beings are equal. A very f a feminist who isn't in Wikipedia on this issue. Uh, yeah, I just looked up a UDHR page. It's one of the reasons why you shouldn't really always trust Wikipedia. Um, the person who actually put some of this language in that I talked about, all human beings are equal in dignity and rights um, uh, and endowed with conscience and reason, you know, these came as much from the East as from the West and from the battle against the British Empire. Um, I didn't have to fight for my atheism and like Chris, I would always see myself as not an aggressive atheist. A great deal of my work was spent defending minority religions under attack. And being an Indian, it meant defending Christians and Hindus whose mosques and churches were being attacked, who were being individually lynched, and so on. But I also, with Mariam, began to work with the ex-Muslim movement. And I know from reading about it and from the people that I was on the platform with this morning and from young people uh, who have talked about it, is that they didn't come from that privilege of not having to be aggressive in their atheism. And they weren't, in fact, aggressive. Just simply to pronounce it was to, and I, I put it in language of a declaration that I hope you'll read in your pack, is to fall into a human rights void. I would have said a black hole, but then some scientists would say, you don't understand what a black hole is. But, you know, <laughs> so void is a term I understand. It is to completely lack all human rights protection. On the panel this morning, there were people who simply because they are atheists, not because they've ever offended anybody intentionally or anything, they just declared their atheism and they are arrested and tortured, put before a military tribunal, lose custody of their children, lose their home, lose their job. They lose every single civil and political right going. And this conference is a secular conference, but it's also the 10th anniversary, maybe some of you don't know, 
of the ex-Muslims organization. And that is, in a way, an identity-based movement. They didn't just declare themselves atheists. They stood as a beacon to other atheists, to other people, that atheism was possible, that you can challenge apostasy laws and blasphemy laws. So we're at a particular moment when the arguments that we've used in the past don't always work. And I work with Karima, and I work with Mariam, and you know, I don't agree with everything Richard Dawkins said, but actually, coincidentally, I was contacted by a young man. Uh, I don't know, actually, he may not be young, but anyway, I think he's on a listserv of queers against Israeli terrorism, who had been campaigning against Dawkins um, uh, to, to ask him to be de-platformed uh, on this uh, radio station, which was talked about in the morning. And he had written a letter to the radio station saying, Richard Dawkins was an inspiration to me on many counts. And he had actually written to this listserv, which was campaigning against uh, Professor Dawkins and saying, please write to the radio station and, and you know, talk about his right to, uh, you know, to appear on the platform. And it's really important to hear him. So these arguments are going on in many different situations. Discomfort has to be a part of our movement. You know, we have sat in many, 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 many meetings where we sit among religious people and we defer and we, you know, recognize that they are oppressed by racism, by religious bigotry and so on. There are very few meetings in the 40 or so years I've been active where atheists are allowed to be public about the receiving end of their oppression. I think we have to hold both these things in mind. You know, I know exactly what you were saying, Chris. You know, we, we, we face a lot of, um, uh, th th there is sometimes uh, white bigotry from atheists who assume things about Islam. And I've seen Mariam support my colleague, Yasmin Rahman, who's going to speak tomorrow, uh, who is a believer. And she has, you know, Yasmin got up and defended her when young atheists were attacking her simply for being a believer on a platform. And in fact, she was defending, it was a platform, it was a meeting about apostasy and blah blasphemy and Sharia and Yasmin took great, great takes great lists all the time speaking as a believer to defend ex-Muslims and other atheists. So we do all this stuff all the time and we are going to have our disagreements and we are going to get upset. I don't think we can demand that people don't feel uncomfortable. I'd like to say to my Muslim friends, you know, it is going to be uncomfortable sometimes. You know, there are people who are going to think that, you know, religious belief is not a basis for managing your life. And I think you have to be prepared to listen to it because we have all been uh, defending people when they're being lynched. You know, we haven't talked about him, the Hindutva movement. You'll hear tomorrow about it. I hope, you know, uh, we make sure that you hear about it. People think that only the monotheisms can be fundamentalist. No, you know, any religion can take up a violent religious fundamentalism. And in the case of India, they, they're attacking people on the basis that they're beef eaters. You know, they've, they've invented this new term. You're a beef eater, so you're sitting on a train and you can be murdered by a gang of thugs who get on the train and say you're, you know, and atheists have been murdered in exactly the same ways for a very, very long time. And it's only atheists who are defending other atheists in general. I think the human rights movement defends it, the symptoms of the attack. I mean, they, they may defend the individual atheists. And let me tell you, supporting people who are in jail for blasphemy laws and so on, we have not had money from the major human rights organizations. It's smaller organizations G Gita, that are sorry, fighting this. Apologies. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going I'm, to stop. But yeah, I'm yeah. saying that these are multiple problems. We are going to disagree. They're going to be really, really, really upsetting. But we have to hold the space of secularism. I agree with uh, Karima, then they're, they're not contiguous, they're not the same. But quite often secularists defend themselves by saying we're not atheists. And sometimes secularists are not atheists and we have to recognize that. But sometimes secularists are atheists and they do have human rights. Thank you. Very, very nicely put. I mean, one, one thing we do recognize, yes, I'm coming to you. Uh, can, can, can I just, yes. One thing we must recognize that the secular risk movement or the secular movement. I mean, we are not a body of just one opinion. I mean, we have diversity of opinions. We disagree with each other. We, we get very emotional and uh, yes. 
but one thing is that our diversity uh, actually makes us stronger probably the strongest political force out there. So with that, uh, yes, you have been waiting for long, yes. Yes, thank you. I don't understand this discussion. Chris, you want respect for believers and non-believers based on human rights and with separation of church and state because it is uh, the principle of secularism. Do you understand well? Yes. 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 You want respect for both, for people. But why you want respect for ideas? Why you don't accept that we can criticize and even mock and even more bad, maybe, say about ideas which are in our eyes, not very um, clever, or not, for example, uh, based on uh, scientific evidence. You know that such approach leads, like in Poland, to the uh, decision of uh, deputy minister of education to introduce creationism, is teaching to schools because everything is equal. Creationism, he says, evolutionary, evolutionary theory, all that are hypotheses and should be, to, uh, should be in the school curriculum. I don't agree on it. Again, respect for people, but not for ideas. Thank you. I am going to take Sorry, I have not been fair to the right-wingers. Uh, I am going to take a question from here, lady. Uh, yes, you. And this is the last question. Please be uh, brief. Okay, um, it's to Karima. And it's just it's a kind of a, a, a technical question. I was a bit concerned about, you're talking about secularism as a human right. And I find that in the UN documents and things like that, it is a bit woolly. They never come out directly and say that. So how can we move that forward? I find that at the European Court, they have defined secularism as a philosophical conviction worthy of respect in a democratic society. Just the same as you could say they respect religions or they're under freedom of religion and belief. But secularism in the European Court comes under uh, um, belief. But in, in the UN documents, it doesn't seem to, there's nothing there that defines it in that way. And the only way I, I can think of that they said in, a, in the relation to Ireland, they said in a docu one, document once that parents have, um, are denied access to a secular education. So you're denied something that you have a right to something. But I haven't ever seen any of the documents saying that they see secularism as a philosophical conviction with the same rights under freedom of religion and belief. And how can we move that forward within the human rights framework? Th thank you very much. I, I hate myself because, you know, like the, the debate is sort of heating up and I have to wrap, wrap up now. Uh, I'll give, uh, so that was the last question I took. Uh, I'll give the floor to Karima for her quick concluding comments. I think it's a very important question and a very difficult one and I can't answer it briefly so I'll just say one thing and I'd be happy to talk to you quickly afterwards. Uh, clearly there's nothing specific in the human rights documents about a right to secularism. I mean this is very clear but I think there's two ways it enters. One is uh, that it could be argued to be uh, sort of a, a belief in the, and that would be protected by freedom of religion or belief, Article 18, and I think the Human Rights Committee is very clear uh, that it would include uh, beliefs like that, although I'm not aware of specific language uh, that makes that uh, point. Uh, but it is also, uh, and I think Tasneem made this point very well in his opening remarks, about a framework which is essential for the enjoyment of other rights, including freedom of religion of, uh, or belief for anyone, whatever their belief 
beliefs are, uh, including the rights of minorities, which someone mentioned this morning uh, and Tasni mentioned again as well uh, in this area uh, for which secularism is a critical bulwark. And I think there's been this huge backlash against secularism in the human rights world uh, and we really have to challenge that and, and turn that around. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm we really, can't hear you. So, no, uh, sir, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I cannot take your question right now. Thank you. You, you, can, you can actually ask the panelists after the event, okay? Thank you. Uh, who's on? Your concluding comments. Well, uh, to me, secularization is a process. It cannot be uh, minimized into a declaration by a particular institution or a government per se. I mean, we've seen many secular states that roll back later on on various rights and freedoms and so on. So I think for me, the momentum is within the society, is within the grassroots activism and writing and intellectualism as well as uh, creativities that to uh, turn secularism into a process where it will be difficult to roll it back really I mean uh, whatever other uh, declarations and so on I mean uh, with my due respect to Karima and I love the work you are doing but for example just to give you an example about the Iraq war by the allies there were tons of UN resolutions and nobody really gave a damn about any of them including the people who were who were at the top seats of the UN so let's not be really you know uh, kind of taken by that for me secularization is a process. Whatever everyone or each of us are doing, it has to go back to the grassroots. It has to go back to actually transforming the society into a secularized society whereby people are free, women are free, creativity is free, and, and freedom for all religions and from all religions as well. Thank you. Uh, Chris, your concluding comments. I was afraid this was gonna happen. And um, this is what I specifically said, uh, lampooning, criticizing, satirizing religious beliefs is completely fine in a secularist framework and it is something that I have done, as I explained. Um, attacking religious believers and the dignity and the intelligence of religious believers um, is also fine if people want to do that. Um, but that is not something that you know is inherently secularist in and of itself. Huh? People can do that, but um, that's fine. But um, apart from that, um, I really don't hope. I really hope that I know there are very many very brave atheists here, and um, whose work I've been supporting for the last years. Um, I really hope that nobody thinks that I've been trying to silence them, betray them, um, with notions of offense or anything like that. Uh, for me, this is very clear. Secularism. Yes, by all means, freedom of expression. Yes, by all means, in all circumstances. Promotion of personal beliefs about deity and supernatural beings, I think that's a different question. Thank you. Teresa. Well, for me, uh, a secular state is uh, a play, uh, uh, a state where is people are not priests who organize society that allows uh, free thinking, free speech, that promotes science and has a, a clear separation between churches and, and religion and, and, uh, and politics. So it's the way that uh, we have organized our life lately in Europe and the, in the, that uh, area that we call Occident. Thank you. Uh, Michael, your concluding comments. Yeah, I, I suppose in, in Ireland we have not just in theory but in practice we have an alliance with Ahmadi Muslims and evangelical Christians on the issue of secularism. So th this isn't just theory, this is working in practice. Now possibly it comes down to personal chemistry and just the in integrity and trust in the, the individuals because the, the uh, evangelicals and the, the Ahmadis in Ireland both have leaderships that, that, that do actually defend atheist rights in the same way as we will defend their rights. But we're all three happy to do that on the understanding that outside of our secular alliance, they will still be promoting their beliefs and we will still be promoting our beliefs about, about atheism. And that's the essence of secularism, is, is, is that nobody should have to give up 
the right to promote what they genuinely believe uh, in, in, in a truly secular society. Thank you. Thank you. Any? Well, may I say amen? <laughs> um, I think that it's very important to have different ways of promoting secularism, and there can be purely state church lobbies made up of believers and non-believers, or just believers or just non-believers. But I do think that ultimately it is really essential that we free thinkers, non-believers, atheists, whatever, do um, get a place at the table and do promote our viewpoints. If we were waiting for religionists to come up with the idea of separation of church and state, it wouldn't happen. It's a product of the Enlightenment and uh, something to be very proud of. Thank you. So the, one of the pluses of chairing a panel is that no matter how smart your co-panelists are, you get the final word. Uh, I personally think that we cannot uh, talk about rights without talking about secularism. And one example is the non-derogable uh, right of right to life. And we watch the film and world over, uh, if, we, if we read uh, the human rights instruments and read the details about our right to life, and then we look at the religious law of punishing apostasy, for example, absolutely incompatible with each other. So if we want to, if we want to uh, establish, create, develop, a society based on human rights. We must actually build a secular society. With that, thank you very much uh, for listening to us. And I'd like to thank our four panelists. Thank you. And thank you, Hasnim, for that uh, smart chairing of the panel.